Um, like Jean Rice mentioned, I am a broadband program specialist with NTIA. I've been with NTIA for just over a year, um, working on the Broadband USA program and facilitating and coordinating our relationship with states, primarily through our uh, state broadband leaders network. Um, without further ado, I will go ahead and get started. We have four panelists here today um, to discuss um, education and health response for our panel. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick it off and introduce our first speaker, Chris Walker. Chris is a telecommunications director with NOAAnet. Chris has been with NOAAnet since 2001 and has acted as a department head for many of NOAA's um, functions, including network operations and engineering, outside plant construction, network operations center, professional services, and community outreach. Currently in his role as the tech, uh, telecommunications director, excuse me, he delivers on network growth and expansion, strategic planning, capital development um, of outside plants, and broadband planning for emerging, emerging public benefits networks. Um, he was the executive director of NOAANET under BTOP construction build out and, and sets of architectural direct, set the architectural direction of the network facilities throughout the site. Um, prior to coming to knowing that he served 12 years in the armed forces in various management and leadership roles. Um, so without further ado, I will pass it off to Chris Walker. Thanks, Gilbert. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Well, thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, as you heard Gilbert say, I'm Chris Walker. I'm the telecommunications uh, director with Noanet. And I'm here to share with you uh, the efforts uh, in Washington state towards, uh, towards solving uh, the problem that has been incredibly difficult for us to overcome for w well over 20 years. And, and Gilbert, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, our topic name, as you saw, is, is uh, striving for digital equity. Um, but exactly what is digital equity? And I thought it'd be important to define it real quick. Uh, digital equity is a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, our democracy, and our economy. Digital equity is necessary for civic and cultural participation, employment, lifelong learning, and access to essential services. And as you can see from this slide, Washington State has a broadband gap between the haves uh, and the have-nots. Uh, and this problem has been incredibly highlighted by the COVID pandemic. A lack of digital access is a lack of access to education. Digital equity solutions will solve the homework gap it will provide skills training to the unskilled. It will give students access to counselors struggling with their new norm. Uh, and it will provide access to content to assist with social services, such as telehealth and programs for the poor. Next slide, please. Now, as an effort to better understand this problem and to subsequently find a solution, uh, we've created here in Washington State the Digital Equity Task Force. And much like in many states, we have a dynamic rural broadband environment. Incumbent providers have geographical areas that are adequately served, and public agencies, such as Washington State Public Utility Districts and NOANET, uh, have overcome the digital divide in many of our areas. But even then, our state has a large technology access gap to fill. Our task force needs to uh, better understand that gap. We have data disparity in FCC mapping and our <laughs> harsh reality, and we have a diminishing investment pool uh, of broadband providers serving our rural markets. Once we can substantiate this problem from a data analysis perspective, we can tie together grant funding, both at the state and federal level, and tie that with willing network providers serving our rural areas. Next slide, please. This slide here represents the digital task force members <clears throat> that are included in our state. The key to this is the glue that binds the solutions to the problem together. Historically in our state, Every organization has had the same good intentions, but each organization has worked in silos. We learned years ago, this is what divides us and our state broadband plan needs to be a collective solution. I'm gonna highlight a couple of the participants that you see on this screen. First is the office of the governor. And of course, they are the foundation for what our future state broadband plan will look like. And they understand that we have a problem. And through the 2020 broadband bill, they've earmarked funds to support rural broadband by creating a grant and loan program administered by the Department of Commerce. This program helps broadband providers, tribes, and other public agencies support to support rural initiatives in severely distressed communities. 
We expect these programs to continue and with the Digital Equity Task Force, better bringing to light the problem and we expect funding to grow. In addition, the Washington PUD Association, which is a mix of PUDs in the state who provide water, sewer and electrical services in their state counties, uh, they have broadband authority and are aggressively investing in infrastructure. They provide open access networks to support fiber to the home and businesses in rural communities. And in addition, the Washington Library Association, they connect the broadband to our community by creating access to digital social services, such as job hunting and technology education, our citizens can go to the library and with the tools and computers available to them, get the services they need. This program has really turned libraries into something far more than just a place to get books. And these are just a few of the examples as you see on the screen that are champions of rural broadband and why are such key players in our digital equity strategy. Next slide, please. The foundation of digital equity is access to infrastructure that supports both affordability, accessibility, and reliability. We will tackle affordability and accessibility first. What's great about today's technology is how easy it is to correlate data sets. We can efficiently through our existing data and some additional survey plans we have in place, determine where the broadband gaps are for our students and our senior citizens, among others, and connect those dots. We can also determine those families that simply cannot afford today's market-based broadband services and get them the subsidies and solutions that they need. In short, we have to have a broadband service inventory. We can create heat maps that show clearly the access to today's 25-3 minimum mandated FCC speed rules, and we can identify those gaps in service. And as well, we can forecast the, those areas that have no broadband plans or champions towards developing infrastructure for Washington State's 2028 broadband goal, which is 150 megabits per second symmetrical. Once we learn quantifiably what the problem is, we can bring stakeholders together around coordinating statewide efforts towards an all-encompassing solution. And as a collective, this group of champions will advocate for resources from funders and policymakers to support strategies and policies to close the digital divide. We will advocate for policies, programs, and resources to fund solutions for digital inclusion and lastly, connect resources to funding to execute our strategy. Next slide, please. Now, of course, there will not be a one size fits all solution for our entire state. We know we can deploy cost effective wireless solutions at incredibly swift, swift pace. And I will talk more about that in detail uh, during tomorrow's Northwest Regional Panel. Uh, and I'd hope and encourage you to attend that. And with this approach, we can get our kids back to school and we can gain access to broadband for telehealth solutions for community hospitals, which rely on the support that our rural citizens need. Then we look to infrastructure and providing high capacity symmetrical services to those areas uh, with wireline solutions. Built over time with assistance from the federal government and the state, our state's broadband goal has, can be adopted and accomplished by the year 2028. Every citizen in our state have access to 150 megabit symmetrical service. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. And I really just provided it here for informational purposes. Uh, these slide decks I understand will be available to audiences uh, upon conclusion of this seminar. And, and what I really like about this slide is it gives a great job uh, of itemizing the different value add services that digital equity um, creates through digital inclusion. And all these bullets you see on the screen I use from time to time again to show decision makers what we can accomplish with digital equity and further help support the funding of those digital equity strategies. Next slide, please. That's it, thank you for your time. Uh, I know that we're actually gonna wait till the very end for questions, so I don't think we'll be taking them here. Uh, so with that, Gilbert, I'll turn the mic over to you, sir. I was on mute. Um, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, like you said, we're gonna hold questions for now until everyone's gotten a chance to present on this panel. Um, so next, I will pass it over to David Witkowski. Uh, David is an author, advisor, and strategist who works at the intersection between local government and the telecommunications industry. He is a fellow of, in the Radio Club of America, an IEEE senior member and founder and CEO of Oku Solutions. Um, it is the executive director of the Wireless Communications Initiative in Joint Venture Silicon, at Joint Venture Silicon Valley. After serving in the U.S. Coast Guard and earning his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of California, 
He held leadership roles for the for companies ranging from Fortune 500 multinationals to early stage startups. He serves as co-chair of the deployment working group at IEEE Future Networks, co-chair of the GCTC wireless supercluster at NIST, and as an expert advisor to the California Emerging Technology Fund. Without further ado, I will hand it over to David for his presentation. Thank you, Gilbert, and good day to everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak to you today. Uh, we, I'll be talking about uh, the response that we have made to bridge the digital divide is specifically related to distance learning and uh, telehealth in the region of uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, next slide, please. So certainly uh, the digital divide existed before COVID. Uh, we, you know, it didn't cause the problem, but it certainly exposed that we had a, a significant issue. And we, uh, as we moved in early 2020 to distance learning uh, and a lot of students were sent home. Uh, I remember that day very well because as my kids were coming home, kind of asking questions and feeling a little scared about what was going on, I was getting repeated phone calls from a variety of uh, entities around the Silicon Valley and the education space, county leaders, uh, asking the question, what are we, you know, what can we do to provide broadband for our students? So we really went into a, um, you know, sort of a, an emergency operations mode at that point, trying to help as many people as we could with advice. Ultimately, we ended up with what I think has become the standard solution for many uh, school districts, which is to hand out 4G hotspots, or in cases where hotspots were not available, they uh, they handed out smartphones and used them as hotspots. The challenge that we get with this, of course, is that the per is the per unit cost per month for these SIM cards that drives the hotspots are about somewhere between twenty to thirty five dollars per month, and of course they had to buy the hotspots and the phones. And as you can see, um, just from one map on our on your screen there, that's uh, that's just one school district that they're that they're dealing with. So those are the hotspots that were handed out in in that district. So the the cost to these districts has been significant and uh, challenging for their budgets. So the question becomes is what can we do that would allow us to address both the pre-COVID broadband gap and also to eliminate this per month uh, hotspot SIM card charge. Next slide, please. We're also working with the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, uh, which is in the Santa Cruz County uh, area, uh, slightly outside Silicon Valley. But there, are, this is another area that has had significant issues. Uh, working with a local ISP has proven to be key in this, uh, as the ISP, of course, anchors the uh, accounts and handles a lot of the the day-to-day -day operations of the network. So, in my um, experience over the past few months, I, I think having an ISP involved uh, who can handle that sort of day-to-day -day user operations is really key to making this happen because otherwise you're creating an ISP and there's a lot of work in there that you probably um, haven't thought through but is gonna show up in, in the day-to-day -day implementation of your network. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so I think that, you know, this is an ongoing challenge uh, and it's unlikely to be solved unilaterally by local governments. I, I think that there are local governments, school districts, uh, offices of education uh, that would like to be potentially in the, in the, it's not that they wanna be in the business of providing broadband, but they feel like they have to. Um, I think the challenge that they face is, as I mentioned, you know, so there's that ongoing sustaining of the network, there's the ongoing support of users, um, and the exception, I would think, is some major cities, like, for example, the city of San Jose has been pretty programmatic about their broadband deployments. Uh, they've done a lot of work to bring broadband into the Eastside Union High School District, to the James Lick, uh, Overfelt neighborhoods. There's, there's a deliberate program there. But, you know, bear in mind that San Jose is the 10th largest city in the nation and has a, a, some pretty good resources. Uh, a small town that has a staff of six is unlikely to do that. So small school districts it, are really uh, going to be uh, challenged to, to do things like this. And so I think what we need to do is uh, aggregate at the regional level 
uh, bring these uh, bring these people together and begin, for example, I mean, if we just look at the hotspot cost challenge, if we got all the school districts in the region together and did a, a group buy, we could probably get that hotspot cost down below $20. Uh, if, each, if each school district is gonna go out and strike their own deal with a carrier, then we're, uh, we're not gonna be leveraging those economies of scale and we won't be getting those discounts, uh, those volume discounts that I think uh, some districts like LA Unified are getting their hotspots for something, I, I think I'd heard that they're getting for around $10 a month. So that's half of what we're paying at our lowest rate here in the Silicon Valley. Uh, and again, I, I think that um, have partnering with the ISPs is really key to making this happen. That's just an experience, in, in, my, in my experience, I think that's really critical. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and, and that was my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, happy to take them. I guess Gilbert will do that at the end, right? Gilbert, yes, we'll hold questions now for the end. Um, and with that, thank you very much, David. That was a great panel. Um, I will then pass it off to John Griffith um, as our next panelist. Um, John Griffith is a principal artificial intelligence engineer um, at MITRE. John, um, oh, and deputy site leader at MITRE, excuse me, uh, University of Virginia's health site. Uh, John has worked across the federal government in areas including computational linguistics, data science, and science and technology analysis. His focus on making the world a healthier place through health information technology. John's approach involves identifying uh, and nurturing techn new technologies and their creators by building bridges to the innovation ecosystem and partnering with international standards organizations to promote interoperability and adoption of these technologies. Without that further ado, I will pass it off to John. Or John. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, my, we can hear you. I'm coming across well. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't have any slides. Um, if uh, <laughs> I, I will say, um, uh, David's uh, comments were uh, great to follow up on because um, uh, I, I might call this segment a hot spot is not enough. Um, I, I am the uh, rural canary in the coal mine here. Um, and uh, I have like poor connectivity issues right now. It's fine, but at any second it could change. If it does, let me know. I'll turn my camera off because that will, um, it's mostly my upload speeds. Um, but I'll just, I'll just give you a little sense of my experience here. Oh, see, now I've got a thing that says your connection is unstable. It just popped up. Um, so if you can hear, if you if you have a problem hearing me, just give me a sign or something. I'll turn my video off. Um, so you know, I'm I'm uh, honored to be on this panel, and uh, it's great to see so many vets here. I want to thank you all for your service. Um, uh, so my daughter, I have a nine year old, um, and uh, you know, as I said, I I've on I'm on Zoom and things like that all day long. Um, have issues. Um, it's intermittent. My wife has the same thing. She's doing stuff. You know, I told her right now. I'm like, I'm going to give a talk. <laughs> don't broadcast anything right now. Um, my daughter, my wife came in the other day, my daughter was online at school, right? And, uh, you know, she's having this proud mama moment. My daughter is describe, yeah, answering some question the teacher asked, and she gets done, and my wife's like, oh, that was like so great. And the teacher says, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we couldn't hear any of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the school has told us, they're like, well, we can get you a hotspot. Um, and I basically wrote them back and I said, you know, I've spent over a hundred hours. I moved here about a year ago. I've spent over a hundred hours uh, researching everything. I've had satellite, I've had MoFi, I've had, you know, um, I, you know, I have dial up DSL right now. Um, it's intermittent. Um, the, the service is really bad. It'll go down for weeks at a time. Um, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, but you know, I, I'm privileged. Like, uh, I realize a lot of people, um, you know, I talk about equity and, uh, um, you know, affordability. I can afford standard service. I just can't afford the million dollars that it would take to get fiber to my door. Um, I don't know how that's going to happen. Um, and I'm in a little bit of a valley. I'm not quite at the top of the hill. I'm just a little bit. So terrain is a real problem. And I, you know, I just got off a meeting um, with a couple of broadband authorities from local counties. And you know, that's one of the issues around here is that terrain is a, is a big deal. Um, it makes it hard to lay cable. It makes it hard to get signals. You know, um, this is a beautiful place where I live out here. Um, 
they have rules about you can't put cell towers above the tree line. Well, that pretty much trees are great absorbers of um, the frequencies that <laughs> cell signals are at. So that's that's a real problem. Um, so we've been working with, uh, um, so I, I'm with MITRE. MITRE uh, is a federally funded um, research and development center. We work across the United States government, um, but also with uh, local governments as well. Um, and the site here, we focus on working with um, the University of Virginia, particularly the health system. Um, and we've been working with the telehealth group. Um, we started over a year ago, uh, but suddenly when COVID came, we got heavily involved in um, trying to help them scale, you know, applying our systems engineering to what they're doing, um, you know, and uh, hel helping them try to measure where they need their, where they need um, more connectivity and um, trying to come up with a plan for um, doing that. You know, you've all heard the, the stories, um, hospital systems everywhere are looking through the manuals, um, you know, they were several months ago uh, to try and figure out if they had bought the module for their EHR uh, for telehealth and how to turn it on. Um, UVA has been doing this for a long time. They're, they've really been um, leaning out. So they, they know how to do it. So it's, it's been a lot of fun to work with them. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple other things, just um, security and privacy. Um, healthcare is the largest sector for cyber attacks. Um, uh, just today, the, um, there was this joint cybersecurity advisory on imminent ransomware attacks on healthcare systems. Um, in September, there was actually evidence that um, a German woman's death was likely due to a ransomware attack um, by getting delayed um, care. So, uh, and healthcare data is extremely valuable for identity theft and for fraud. Um, connectivity, there's, there's lots of money available. Some would say not enough. There's probably, hopefully there's more coming. Um, and that's important, but that's not enough by itself. Um, you know, one of the problems is data. Uh, like, how do we know where to put, um, how do we know where to put services, right? What to upgrade? That's a big problem because we don't. You know, a lot of times maps are down to like the zip code level. That's still pretty. That's still a pretty big area, and even those maps are are pretty bad. Um, and then there's the question of, um, you know, it's going to be the uh, the internet providers that are putting those cables out or whatever they're doing, um, and they're pretty much booked up right now. So just throwing more money at the problem is going to be a real. It's a, it's a question of how do we help them do that? You know, internet uh, interim solutions are good. I don't know, um, and there are a number of those. Um, Let's see, you know, another thing is I wanted to touch on just quickly is um, I'm involved in an IEEE effort uh, standard called P2795. Um, it's a standard for sharing analytics. The idea is that instead of sh centralizing all of your data to one place and operating on it, you keep the data where it is and you move the analytics there and send the results back. Um, and so I think in the longer term, things like this, I mean, one of the reasons that we have come up with this and designed it is for things like telehealth and rural telehealth um, and also austere environments that you might have um, with uh, um, military medical facilities. They don't have a big pipeline. They're not going to send around MRIs, right? They need the, they need the smarts at the end. Um, you know, if you've been following the business news, NVIDIA, which is the largest um, or the probably the best known, a leader in the, the field of um, hardware for artificial intelligence is trying to buy ARM, which is the a leader in the field of mobile devices. So these devices are getting smarter and smarter. Um, so we, we need to figure out in the long term, how do we use all of that to our advantage as well? Um, there's a lot more I could talk about, but I'll leave it at that for the moment. No worries. Thank you very much, John. Um, and without further ado, I'll introduce our last panelist, Danae Wilson with the Nest Price Tribe. Uh, Danae has been in the technology field working to bring technology services to regions and communities where service does not exist or is extremely limited. Uh, she lives and works on the Nest Pierce Tribe, or reservation, excuse me, reservation in Northern Idaho. She is currently the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians Telecom and Technology Co-Chair, the, the FCC Native Nations Communications, uh, FCC uh, Native Nations Communication Task Force Committee Co-Chair and sits on the FCC Intergovernmental Affairs Committee. She is also on the Native Public Media Advisory Board. Danae serves as the National 
Congress of American Indians representative to the First Net Authority, Tribal Working Group, and SAFECOM. Danae sits on the, also sits on the State of Idaho Broadband Task Force. So without further ado, I will pass it off to Danae. Hello, how are you guys doing today? So I also don't have slides and, um, and I had my camera off earlier today because I have my nine-year-old granddaughter with me and she is trying to do her schoolwork. So we have to juggle. We in, I live in North Central Idaho on the Nez Perce Reservation and, um, and connectivity uh, is limited. So we're underconnected. I wouldn't say we, we have zero connection or poor connection. We're just underconnected. Uh, with, with schools going half time, um, most of the students in the region uh, can't do um, Zoom meetings. There just isn't enough bandwidth for 300 students to do Zoom meetings. So we're, we're doing an A-B schedule. And, um, and so the students are uh, logging in and doing classes. Uh, and then they go through tutorials um, pre-recorded. Uh, in order to do the lesson. So they rewind and replay and rewind and replay in order to make sure that they are um, getting their lessons done. So um, sharing bandwidth is an absolute must in our region. And, uh, but there are, um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I, I do think connectivity is coming to rural locations. I think you can choose to have quality of life no matter where you're at. And so I personally choose to live rural. I, um, I've lived in urban areas and I've worked in urban locations and, and my personal choice is to live and work with my own people here on the Nez Perce Reservation and to bring connectivity to them so, so that we have cho choices uh, in how we wanna live our lives. So um, building those bridges and, and uh, taking some of the um, opportunities that, that we have, um, working with your state offices, working with uh, um, educational institutions, your health clinics, um, whatever those uh, institutions are that are also trying to um, bring connectivity for their own purposes, um, oftentimes can be expanded and can be uh, um, added to the larger connectivity issues. So um, not to jump forward too far, but but some of the questions that I, I've seen in the um, Q&A that have come up have talked about municipalities and and um, uh, co-owned fiber, as an example, not just relying on your traditional telcos to come in and do everything. When I mean, we heard from Chris, Chris Walker, sorry, stumbled that a little bit earlier in, in the conversation about NoahNet and what all the partners that they have, and you've seen a great slide of all the partners that they have. It truly takes partnership, um, public-private partnership, uh, industry and, and governmental partnerships. Those partnerships are critical to deploying uh, equitable connectivity across the U.S. We can't look at it from the same standard model that we've seen for 50 years saying telecommunication companies are going to bring it to us. That's just not the reality. There's no ROI in it. So we definitely have to um, look at how we can develop these partnerships and pull these pieces together to bring connectivity to the underconnected. So while we can say, um, well, the 90% of the U.S. is connected, uh, my connection and your connection are definitely not the same. <laughs> so we need to think about that equitable connectivity so that we can do the same type of business um, in, in locations that are underconnected uh, as people in um, very urban settings can, can uh, connect. And I'm not saying all urban is connected because um, I work with Department of HUD quite a bit and uh, um, their uh, Department of HUD has projects on tribal lands but they also do projects in inner cities and do city projects. And some of those uh, locations are also underconnected and they can be smack dab in the middle of a city. So it really depends on um, what the resources are, uh, what the industry believes that they can get a return on their investment and whether or not they're, they're willing to invest for the um, percentage of return. How long is it gonna take them to recoup? there are definitely ways that those partnerships can bridge those connectivity issues and doing those partnerships makes those dollars go further and brings more people onto a, a faster uh, internet and, and definitely shares the resource. Uh, so I, I do think we have some real opportunity there and I'm hopefully uh, some of these questions we can uh, jump right into them and and um, start answering some of the questions and thinking about partnerships and how we can develop those partnerships and and uh, not to put uh, Chris or David on 
the spot, but they had great slides about how they do partnerships. And, um, and that truly is uh, the new name of the game, whether you're um, totally connected or you're under connected uh, in order to ensure that it's equitable, um, we can't rely on the same old standard model. Great, thank you very much today. I really appreciate it. Um, with that, we'll shift to a few questions for folks, um, both mine and from the chat. Um, first, I want to direct a question at Chris. Um, you spoke of infrastructure as the foundation of digital equity solutions. Um, are there other fundamental or foundational requirements your, your state needs to get full digital inclusion? Uh, beyond just infrastructure? Yeah, yeah beyond just infrastructure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I mean, I think that's really just the first step to the underlying uh, road that we need to take towards uh, supplying digital equity. You know, in, in today's modern era, uh, we're really looking for innovative ways to bring education and uh, public safety to our citizens. Uh, one great example is Next Generation 911 services, where we're taking uh, the ability to uh, coordinate and collaborate during, uh, during a, a, you know, a, a first responder issue where we've got live streaming of potentially what's going on in the field that these first responders can, can see and, and respond and react to before they ever even arrive on site. And so sure, infrastructure is great, but uh, do we really see public safety uh, by infrastructure alone? And no, the answer is we don't. We have to have that innovation and that smart region strategy to really bring the technical advanced services that, that, that the consumer market needs. And, and Next Generation 911 is, is a fantastic example. Uh, you know, also in Washington State, uh, well, and we know it really well during this past summer is uh, fires are incredibly challenging to deal with. And so uh, we've got to find ways to uh, creatively keep connectivity up in, in our areas as these fires ravish our, ravish our neighborhoods, uh, including such things as tsunami warning warnings, devices, and so forth. Uh, all of these things enable um, a safer, better world. So I really look to innovation as being the answer. Great, thank you. Um, David, I know you brought up um, the hotspot issue that seems to be the, the big solution that a lot of communities are deploying um, to get students connected. Um, but how can local governments beginning to think more sustainably about those issues, uh, particularly smaller local communities? So I think that uh, the, I think the hotspot solution works, although it's expensive. Of course, John would argue that it is for his neighborhood not a solution. And in fact, we have many cases where it is not a solution. Um, you know, having local ordinances that are frankly driven by sort of popular conceptions as opposed to science and engineering is, is a challenge. I mean, if you're going to say, for example, that and this is an example from a community here in the Bay Area that they, they tried to implement a thing where they said that they wanted to keep all cell sites a thousand feet away from homes. Well, it was a bedroom community. There, there is no commercial land anywhere in this community. So the entire place is homes. Ergo, you know, that's an effective prohibition. I mean, if you can't put a cell site within a thousand feet of a home, then you're effectively saying you can't put a cell site in that town. Now what happens when people start saying, well, my kids can't go to school and the hotspot doesn't work. Suddenly they're, they're now, we've had cases where um, communities that were very aggressive about saying no to infrastructure have now turned around and started contacting their Congress uh, representative and saying, well, what are you gonna do to fix this connectivity problem? And then they contacted the carriers and said, hey, can you go into this community and fix this? And they, they said, Sure, yeah, three years from now when our capital plan allows for it, but you said no last year, ergo, we're not gonna be back for another three to four years. So, so I think it's incumbent upon communities to realize that um, infrastructure, and I would, I would argue that infrastructure ranges not only in the wireless side, but also fiber and, and other uh, elements have got to be programmatic. Uh, and I think a lot of jurisdictions, municipalities have been reactive as opposed to proactive. Mm -hmm. So what can communities do to ensure that this is, is um, not going to be an issue in the future? 
is to put the same amount of energy that they put into managing sidewalks and street lights and roads and police and parks and all that stuff. Telecommunications has to be something that cities do deliberately. It, it's not an accident. It's not a, it's not a hobby. And it's not something that should be assigned to, you know, the, the new guy on the team or the, or the woman who just joined and she went to get coffee during the meeting and they said, okay, you know, you left the meeting, so you're the telecom person. It, it can't be an, an accident. It's too important in daily life. I mean, we're, we're conducting this Zoom call over telecom. It, if our telecom is problematic, John was mentioning that he was gonna turn his video off. If we're struggling to, to stay connected, um, you know, then, then that's, a, that's an issue. And cities need to see it, telecom, as something that they do deliberately as opposed to something that they do accidentally. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, Danae, uh, shifting gears slightly, I know you talked a lot about um, building bridges and the importance of partnerships, uh, partnership development, um, and sort of was starting to get at the, the point of aligning goals and making sure that a community, whether it's unconnected or underconnected, is aligning goals um, with you know state or education offices. How can communities begin to think about that goal alignment when approaching partners? So I do think um, uh, definitely there's uh, an opportunity. So, um, one of the things that I've um, been fortunate to do is learn from um, major cities and major communities uh, on the FCC Intergovernmental Affairs Committee, uh, things that we hadn't thought about um, traditionally in Indian country. One of the things that um, I think is important is understanding that the infrastructure that you have and the right-of-ways that you're just willingly giving away for power, for electricity, for streetlights, those are all um, avenues to expand networks. And, and cities yeah. typically, um, communities give that away at no cost, right? Because we want street lighting. So, um, right. so you give away uh, the resource without any reservation for um, uh, expanded use. So I think rethinking some of that, when, when a proposal comes into a city or to a government, um, taking a look at what else could it be used for um, is mm -hmm. the first question. And then who do we reach out to that has knowledge about that? So in rural areas, uh, technical expertise is not just across the street, right? You have to uh, go to a major city to find um, somebody who can help you with understanding what, what are the possibilities. So um, it really does. It starts with a basic conversation. And then um, as, as uh, David mentioned, it's just not assigned to somebody. It needs to be someone who has some understanding that uh, those telephone poles and giving the right of way to those telephone poles or to those street lights, um, there is alternate alternative uses for those to expand connectivity in your communities. And what does that look like? And so uh, then developing the partnership thereafter. Uh, understanding sure. what resources you have is always the first. You can't go buy a new furniture, right? You can't go buy a new couch unless you know you have the money to do it or the credit to do it, right? So sure. think of it in the very same terms, your own personal purchases, as small as they may be, um, does it fit the need? Uh, what else could it be used for? And then how do we make it happen? Uh, so. Sure. Um, those are all really basic questions that I think um, anybody looking to expand services on their communities uh, can start with. Yeah, um, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, I know you mentioned that a lot of times rural communities maybe lack the technical expertise to maybe understanding um, technically how do you build something or what the value is of the resources that they have and the assets that they have. Where can um, leaders within rural communities go to to find that technical expertise? So uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, definitely the universities are sometimes our very first uh, quest, even the community colleges. So you go to your educational institutions first, right? A lot of times they'll have a um, uh, regional board that talks about how they're um, planning their courses and what adult education looks like in the future. Um, but also uh, the other, um, there's some industry leaders like um, Internet Society has tons of free resources on their website. WISPA has a ton of free resources on their website. So there's um, industry leaders that are uh, providing um, guides and suggestions and deployment options uh, that cost nothing. So um, doing just a little bit of research uh, definitely can help. And many times your local community college, your uh, universities, are your very first step, especially if you don't even know the right question to ask, right? Because 
sometimes the issue isn't, I know I need internet, but what does that even mean? How do I even get it? And Mm -hmm. who's responsible to bring it? So then just getting some of the real basic questions answered. Great, thank you very much. Um, Shifting gears from education over to healthcare, I wanna um, ask John a few questions. Um, I know you mentioned that you work a lot in the telehealth space, uh, especially with UVA. You mentioned that they have like they've been doing this for a while. And they they sort of understand things. Um, but what sorts of resources or recommendations would you give to communities that are just starting to think about their telehealth strategies um, and maybe lack or are under or unconnected? Um, well, that that is a good question. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I would echo um, um, uh, some of the things that um, Danae just said. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, universities are a good place to go. You know, I was thinking dur- during what she was saying, like, this is a good list of resources. It would be nice if there were, like, you know, kind of a concierge service you could go to, you know, an ombudsman that would tell you like, oh, <laughs> you know, matchmaking service, a yentl, sure. <laughs> a yentl for, um, <laughs> you know, we need that sort of thing. I mean, there's a lot of good resources, you know, there's the, um, you know, American um, Telemedicine Association, um, you know, w- within, um, so, you know, I've been talking to people in our county um, that we have a broad band authority. A lot of counties have broadband authority. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I think it is that partnership um, that you need to, to form. Um, you know, if somebody can help you form it, that's great. Uh, but you really need, you know, you need the, you need the technical people, you need, um, you know, the people who know healthcare or education. And I actually think the connection between healthcare and education, um, you know, the third piece is you need people who know about the funding and where to get it, right? Because there's money available that a lot of people probably are not aware of that they can get. And there's some money that's um, coming through for broadband for education. Um, and now they're relaxing some of the restrictions on that. Like, so mm-hmm. yes, you could actually, that could also be used to connect to, you know, for healthcare as well. Um, and then there's now money that's coming uh, is, I don't know if it's through the CARES Act or an FCC thing or something I just heard about today, sure. um, more for healthcare, right? And then the question is, um, can that be, you know, that's the primary purpose of it, but if it also helps support education, you know, so you, you need somebody who kind of understand, you need a team that understands um, those issues and how to, to um, it's not, you know, the, the technology, um, you, you need to have um, local service providers, right? Because ultimately they're, you know, in uh, some towns, some counties have um, decided they're gonna do their own thing. And, um, uh, and that's possible, but in a lot of places, you know, they don't have the resources and expertise, um, so they have to rely on the service providers. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think you need to put together, you know, a whole team of, of um, different people that touch on all those things. And if you if you find in your, uh, you've got a team and you're having a meeting and you don't know some something, you probably need to find somebody who knows that and get them on the team. <laughs> Sure, sure. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Gilbert, can I chime in a little bit? Yes, absolutely, David. Please do. So, so uh, I just wanted to mention, because I, I think what John and Danae have described is actually uh, is, is very workable. Um, what Joint Venture Silicon Valley has been doing for a number of years is acting as a convener around this topic. And in 2015, when I realized that we were getting a ton of queries from cities about asking the question, what's a small cell? And, and you know, why did I just get an application for 50 of them in my city? Um, we began realizing that there was a need for training in that regard. And so um, I'm gonna put this into the, into the chat window for everybody. But we, uh, one thing we did was, was we produced a, a handbook, which was specifically written for municipals um, to guide them through the questions, basic questions. It's a primer for, for wireless, if you will. And then we're actually um, in, about two weeks, we're teaching a course, which is gonna be done through the IEEE. And it's actually a national, um, people around the country can attend this, but it's it's a replication of what we do here locally. Um, So if if you have cities that have questions about this topic, one of the recommendations would be um, build a regional wireless or communications task force that can share information. And for example, we get queries all the time. 
hey, I need a consultant. Who should I? Oh, okay, I'm going to refer you to a group of consultants that I that I believe are capable, rather than just hiring somebody's cousin, which is sometimes what happens. And um, but you want to really make sure that you have that that dialogue going on because there's a lot of information sharing that can be done by having those uh, re those regional groups. Yeah. Thank, thank thanks you. for letting me chime in on on that. Yeah, of course. Um, I have a follow up question from that. Yeah. Um, you did mention communities. Um, probably particularly smaller rural communities can look at building um, uh, regional coalitions. How can communities, and this is open to anyone, um, begin engaging um, communities within their region to form those regional um, groups or task forces? I'll open it up to anyone. I think if you have a regional nonprofit or economic development group, that that's probably the way to go. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly uh, in some uh, every region typically has a group that sort of acts as a kind of an extra governmental bridge between the the industry and you know whether that's a chamber of commerce or or, uh, or a regional economic development group. Um, uh, certainly, uh, tribes have their tribal councils, and they they can add a telecommunications. Uh, I know uh, Dene, uh I know Matthew Ritanen, uh I've talked to. He's great, right? And he just sort of goes around and is he's that resource for so many tribes in Western United States. And so I, I think um, it's identifying somebody who everybody feels comfortable uh, having a, be a convener around that topic. And initially, it'll be messy, but uh, as time goes on, you'll you'll figure it out. Yeah, David, I think you nail on the head with the answer to that question. It's really about your local EDC and other sponsor organizations mm -hmm. collaborating together. In our state, we form broadband action teams that are stood up in counties and, and the librarian is there and, and the chief of police is there and, and the EDC is there and they're all working together to understand the problem and then try to match the problem with the, the organizations that are willing to come in and, and, and provide the solution. Right, and, and so you've got to get organized. Yeah, I agree. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> looking at our Q&A chat um, of some of the questions that have come through, it looks like one of them um, from a, a Doug, I believe it came up when Chris, your presentation, the question is, are upcoming satellite technologies likely to alter your strategy? Well, I don't like the word alter. I think in <laughs> our state, much like many others, well, in fact, in our state, uh, we've all heard of Starlink, Starlink right? That's the mm -hmm. Elon Musk uh, organization. Sure. Uh, in, in Forks, Washington, a town that was made famous through the Twilight mo movies, <laughs> it had nothing but dial-up broadband for as long as I can remember. So here we are in the year 2020, and all of a sudden, we've got Starlink broadband access to... Uh, the whole tribe in Forks. And, and I think there's 2,000 residences in, in that city and that town. So, I mean, it's it's not an altar. It's an augment, right? It's a supplement. Mm -hmm. It's an engage. It's an embrace. And uh, I think in one of my slides I mentioned, there is no one solution that's going to solve the problem in, in every situation, right? So it takes people, sure. it takes champions like ours to determine what is the appropriate place and in, in, in the appropriate location. Forks is very, very removed from the rest of the world. Satellite is always a no-brainer, at least for the, the near term. I think too, just in terms of uh, uh, connectivity where you may not already have um, a backhaul, that's the number one problem, especially for tribes, but any rural mm -hmm. area, backhaul is going to be your biggest problem. And mm -hmm. um, while we have stock gaps like uh, the rural tribal window, which is offering an opportunity for tribes to uh, utilize um, 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, licensed spectrum, um, it isn't going to be the end all be all, right? That's not gonna be the final silver bullet that fixes connectivity. Uh, um, Starlink isn't either. I mean, there it's gonna be a combination of, of multiple different types of technologies in order to bridge these gaps. Um, the cost for me to put in fiber uh, in Idaho, North Central Idaho, um, is so much more than than uh, Chickasaw in Oklahoma, as an example, because of the rock, the river rock, the the mountainous terrain, all of the waterways that we have to pull. So, 5G, as an example, relies 100% on fiber connections. Will I see 5G? Maybe in some of the bigger communities, but not not in some of the small communities where a fiber connection is necessary. Um, so there are stop gaps. It's going to take multiple types of technologies. 
Sure, thank you. So, I, so being, being a bit Buddhist, I would say that, uh, you know, everything is temporary. Um, sure. So, you know, that's, so it's, you know, what's going to want, you know, there are near term solutions and there are longer term solutions, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I will just say, as I said, I spent like hundreds of hours <laughs> trying different things. I did satellite for a while. I won't say which one, you know, it wasn't obviously one of the new ones that's just going up. But, uh, you know, I was told this would be great. And um, the yeah. moment they installed it, they're like, we got a good signal. I'm like, but my speed is awful. You know, and I actually got the speed they said at like two in the morning. Um, and then it was very difficult to cancel. They gave me a very hard time about that. So, um, and I know that with satellites, uh, so they just oversubscribed, right? Every, this was like post the beginning of COVID, everybody is working at home, they oversubscribed. Um, and, you know, I know they can control uh, with a footprint, um, you know, that things coming from this region will get, you know, equal footing to things coming from this region or, or more than equal footing, right? So, um, so some of that can be done, but then somebody's got to tell them to do that, right? So it, it's, uh, it's not just simply like, yes, just go satellite and everything will work fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I think my, I mean, I, I, see sol I see some silver hair on the panel here and I can say that we, we've probably all seen the satellite thing come and go uh, more than once, right? So, uh, and for me, it's always been one of those things that's going to be great. Um, and, and in fact, I almost went to work for, um, uh, for Norm Abrams at Aloha, Net or Aloha Networks, which was, um, you know, going, he was the guy that did the original Aloha Net in, in Hawaii. And, and that was going to be a big geosynchronous broadband play and never played out. We saw Iridium come and go. We've seen Global Star come and go. I know Peter from Global Star. I mean, I, we, we've always been, satellites always been around the corner. Now, if Elon can make it happen, that's great. But just heard yesterday that they want six hundred dollars to participate in the beta. So I'm not sure. Does that indicate that there's a challenge there? Um, where is this going to eventually be economical? It, it's it's it could perform well, but be really expensive. It could be cheap and not perform well. We don't know at this point. So a lot of people think Starlink's going to solve all problems and. I'm not sure that that's the case. I mean, I'm I'm old enough to have seen this uh, to seen this show before, and and I'm skeptical. I'll be honest, I'm skeptical because we've never solved that problem. Now, maybe someday we will, and maybe this is the time we will. But my money is on, yeah, not not this time. Sure. History history is not on Elon's side. Sure. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, if we were to overcome, le this is from the, the Q&A chat, if we were able to overcome legal barriers, would gigabit municipal solutions such as uh, Chattanooga offer hope for bridging the digital divide more rapidly? I, I can go first. Um, I, I don't know if it's clear and concise that we would be bringing future proof solutions more rapidly to, to the digital divide areas based on reducing encumbrances, but it seems logical that that would be the case. Uh, it, you know, in, in, in our state a hundred years ago, the electrification of rural, uh, of urban areas was happening quite swiftly, swiftly by the private sector, but they weren't investing in power support facilities in, in our rural areas. And so it took, a, took it upon Washington state to create public utility districts that then used uh, ratepayer uh, fees to build that electrical network and then and then give them the the services that they need. I think that same thing that same same thing applies here, right? Really embracing the private sector in our urban areas, but in in those situations where the private sector cannot get a return on their investment, which seems to be quite common nationwide, right? Is really trying to reduce those restrictions for municipal networks or networks of the same type of uh, character. Um, sure. From, from accessing the network and the consumer. And I just want to add that we need to think about um, how we're funding uh, um, federal subsidies, as an example. Um, most of those go to traditional voice carriers. Uh, today, traditional voice isn't um, always the most economical and definitely isn't the most robust, right? So uh, we need to look at um, funding different types of models uh, that will um, be inclusive of future technologies, uh, things that, that um, don't 
don't require voice. You can clearly hear me. This is a voice communication, right? But this type of communication wouldn't typically be funded. It's not part of their model. And so if it's not part of the model, then it doesn't get funded. Um, those all have to re be revamped. Um, how we fund uh, infrastructure has to be um, updated and changed. And, and that's um, very lacking, right? That's outdated by 50 years. And just to follow up on that a little bit, I mean, and for telehealth, you really need more than, you know, telehealth used to be, yes, you call your doctor, right? Um, mm -hmm. And there is a certain amount of that that's still there. But now it's a lot of it's becoming video. Um, and there's a lot of instrumentation now that's uh, sending data streams. And even with the video, Absolutely. you know, a choppy video is okay in some cases. But in other cases, like if you're doing a stroke assessment, um, there's a way that the doctor can, you know, look at someone's eye, but they actually need like very high resolution. They need no jitter. Um, you know, they only need it for that part of the screen. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of technology that has to be developed for some of this, I think as well. Yeah, I, John, it's always right. be changed. Yeah, at, this, at, this, at the same time, technology is not necessarily the answer to our problem. I mean, technically speaking, our, our network is running multi-channel 400 gig signals down two fiber pairs. I mean, technically speaking, we can do some crazy things with speeds and feeds, um, but that has yet to solve the broadband problem because if it did, it would have already been solved. So really, I'm looking at policy and funding mechanics that would enable rural investment to uh, deliver infrastructure that enables broadband, smart region concepts, digital equity, and all the things that we've talked about on this call. And I think that's an important um, item to discuss because in the chat panel, there's quite a lot of discussion going on right now uh, about technical um, allowances for broadband. And, and absolutely true. We can do some really things, we can do some great things, and we can do them really fast, but they're not available everywhere. And so sure. it goes back to investment. That's 100% right. And, and I think um, even uh, looking outside of our um, standards, so like um, uh, health systems, uh, gaming systems right now can already uh, manipulate how you move. They can follow mm -hmm. you. They can uh, mimic your body. They can see infrared into you, right? Gaming systems. Mm -hmm. That technology is already available. It just needs to be adopted by the health industry. Just because it was designed for a game doesn't mean it can't be used for health, right? So we just sure. need to start thinking of things um, more broadly and, and not pigeonhole them into um, what they were intended for, but what they could be used for. I would echo Chris's comment. I, I think it's it's policy and it's also, you know, uh, it's also deliberateness. So this, I'm reiterating what I said before, uh, you know, it, it can't be, uh, communications is the fifth utility. It, it's just as important as electricity, gas, water, sanitation. If you don't deliberately deliver um, communications to your residents, that, then you, to Danae's point, you, you will wait for the industry to come and do it for you. And that may or may not happen depending upon return on investment. Uh, so so yeah. you, it's great to say the private industry is gonna do it, but then you sit there and hope and, and hope is not a strategy. So I think there's, there's also the possibility of, um, you know, HOV lanes um, for the, for like health data, for instance, um, you know, you're, probably all familiar with FirstNet, you know, they just put out a roadmap like yesterday or something, um, you know, that's for emergency responders, but, um, you know, there needs to be some way that, that says, okay, this is really important. You know, this is life-saving data. Um, you know, it needs to, <laughs> needs to get there faster and more reliably. Yeah. Um, well, with that, I think we're coming close to the end of our hour here on this panel. I want to thank all of our panelists for spending time with us. Um, today. I had a lot of fun um, and learned a lot speaking with you all. And I want to thank um, um, the GCTC for letting me moderate this panel. Um, it was a lot of fun. And with that, I think I will pass it back to either Macy or Jean. I'm not really sure. <laughs>